Introduction The history of the First World War is a deliberately concocted lie, not the sacrifice, the heroicism, the horrendous waste of life, or the misery that followed. No, these were very real, but the truth of how it all began and how it was unnecessarily and deliberately prolonged beyond 1915 has been successfully covered up for a century. A carefully falsified history was created to conceal the fact that Britain, not Germany, was responsible for the war. Had the truth become widely known after 1918, the consequences for the British establishment would have been cataclysmic. At the end of the war, Britain, France, and the United States laid the blame squarely on Germany and took steps to remove, conceal, or falsify documents and reports to, such a, to justify such a verdict. In 1919, at Versailles near Paris, the victors decreed that Germany was solely responsible for the global catastrophe. She had, they claimed, deliberately planned the war and rejected all of their proposals for conciliation and mediation. Germany protested vehemently that she was not responsible and that it had been for her a defensive war against the aggression of Russia and France. To the victors go the spoils, and their judgment was immediately reflected in the official's account. What became the generally accepted history of the First World War revolved around Germany's militarism, militarism, German expansionism, the Kaiser's bombastic nature and ambitions, and Germany's invasion of innocent, neutral Belgium. The, secret, the system of secret alliances, a naval race, economic imperialism, and the theory of an inevitable war later softened in the attack on Germany, though the spurious notion that she alone had wanted war remained understood in the background. In the 1920s, a number of highly regarded American and Canadian professors of history, including Sidney B. Fay, Harry Elmer Barnes, and John S. Ewart, seriously questioned the Versailles verdict and the evidence on which the assumption of German war guilt was based. Their work in revising the official Versailles finding was attacked by historians who insisted that Germany was indeed responsible. Today, eminent British war historians place the blame on Germany, though most are willing to concede that other factors were also involved. Professor Neal Ferguson writes of a of the Kaiser's strategy of global war. Professor Hugh Strachan maintains that the war was about liberal countries struggling to defend their freedoms against German aggression. While Professor Norman Stone states that the greatest mistake of the 20th century was made when Germany built a navy to attack Britain. Professor David Stevenson quite unequivocally writes that it is ultimately in Berlin that we must seek the keys to the destruction of peace. It was Germany's fault. End of story. Several other recent accounts on the cause of the war offer alternative ideas. Christopher Clark's book, for example, looks on the events leading up to August 1914 as a tragedy into which an unsuspecting world sleepwalked we reveal that far from sleepwalking into a global tragedy, the unsuspecting world was ambushed by a secret cabal of warmongers in London. In Hidden History, The Secret Origins of the First World War, we debunk the notion that Germany was to blame for this heinous crime against humanity, or that Belgium was an innocent, neutral nation caught unaware by, Germans, by German militarism. We clearly demonstrate that the German invasion of Belgium was not an act of thoughtless and indiscriminate aggression, but a reaction forced upon Germany when she faced imminent annihilation. 
From the day of its conception, the Schleifen plan was a defense strategy and the last desperate act open to Germany to protect itself. Last act, last desperate act open to Germany to protect herself from being overrun simultaneously from east and west by the huge Russian and French armies massing on her borders. What this book sets out to prove is that unscrupulous men whose roots and origins were in Britain sought a war to crush Germany and orchestrated events in order to bring this about. 1914 is generally considered as the starting point for the disaster that followed, but the crucial decisions that led to war had been taken many years before. A secret society of rich and powerful men was established in London in 1891 with the long-term aim of taking control of the entire world. These individualistic, these individuals, whom we call the secret elite, deliberately fomented the Boer, the Boer, the Boer War in 1899 to 1902 in order to grab the Transvaal's gold mines, and this became a template for their future actions. Their ambition overrode humanity, and the consequences of their actions had been minimized, ignored, or even denied in official histories. The horror of the British concentration camps in South Africa, where 20,000 children died, is conveniently glossed over. The devastating loss of a generation in a world war for which these men were deliberately responsible has been glorified by the lie that they died for freedom and civilization. This book focuses on how a cabal of international bankers, industrialists, and their political agents successfully used war to destroy the Boer republics and then Germany, and were never called to account. Carefully falsified history? A secret society taking control of the world? Britain responsible for the First World War, 20,000 children dying in British concentration camps, a cabal based in London whose prime objective was to destroy Germany. Lest any readers jump immediately to the conclusion that this book is some madcap conspiracy theory, they should, amongst other evidence, consider the work of Carol Quigley, one of the 20th century's most highly respected historians. Professor Quigley's greatest contribution to our understanding of modern history was presented in his books The Anglo-American Establishment and Tragedy and Hope. The former was written in 1949, but only released after his death in 1981. His disclosures placed him in such potential danger from the establishment backlash that it was never published in his lifetime. In a 1974 radio broadcast, Quigley warned the interviewer, Rudy Maxa, of the Washington Post that, you better be discreet. You have to protect my future as well as your own. The Anglo-American establishment contained explosive details on how a secret society of international bankers and other powerful, unelected men controlled the levers of power and finance in Great Britain and the United States of America and had done so throughout the 20th century. Quigley's, Quigley's evidence is considered highly credible. He moved in exalted circles, lectured at the top universities in the United States, including Harvard, Princeton, and Georgetown, and was a trusted advisor of the establishment as a consultant to the U.S. Department of Defense. He gained access to evidence from people directly involved with the secret cabal that no outsider had ever seen. Though some of those facts came from him from sources which he was not permitted to name, he presented only those where he was able to produce documentary evidence available to everyone. Quigley noted a strong link between the highest echelons of power and influence in the British government circles and Oxford University, particularly all souls and 
Balliol Colleges, he received a certain amount of assistance of a personal nature from individuals close to what he called the group, though for obvious reasons he could not reveal the name of such persons. Though sworn to secrecy, quickly revealed in the radio interview that Professor Alfred Zimmer, Zimmer, the British historian and political scientist, had confirmed the names of the main protagonists within the group. Without a shadow of a doubt, Zimmer himself was a close associate to those at the center of real power in Britain. He knew most of the key figures personally and was a member of the secret society for 10 years before resigning in disgust in 1923. Quigley noted that the group appeared oblivious to the consequences of their actions and acted in ignorance of the point of view of others. He described the tendency to give power and influence to individuals chosen through friendships rather than merit and maintained that they had brought many of the things he held dear close to disaster. The great enigma of Professor Quigley lies in his statement that while he abhorred the cabal's methods, he agreed with its goals and aims. Were these merely words of self-preservation? Be mindful of his warning to Rudy Maxa as late as 1974. Quigley clearly felt that these revelations placed him in danger. Through his investigation, we know that Cecile Rhodes, the South African diamond millionaire, formed the secret society in London during the last decade of the 19th century. Its aims included renewal of the bond between Great Britain and the United States, and the spread of all they considered to be good in English ruling class values and traditions. Their ultimate goal was to bring all habitable portions of the world under their influence and control. The individuals involved harbored a common fear, a deep and bitter fear, that unless something radical was done, their wealth, power, and influence would be eroded and overtaken by foreigners, foreign interests, foreign business, foreign customs, and foreign laws. They believed that white men of Anglo-Saxon descent rightly sat at the top of the racial hierarchy, a hierarchy built on predominance in trade, industry, and the exploitation of other races. To their minds, the choice was stark. Either take drastic steps to protect and further develop the British Empire, or accept that countries like Germany would reduce them to bit players on the world stage. The members of the secret elite were only too well aware that Germany was rapidly beginning to overtake Britain in all areas of technology, science, industry, and commerce. They also considered Germany to be a, a cuckoo in the empire's African nest and were concerned about its growing influence in Turkey, the Balkans, and the Middle East. They set out to ditch the cuckoo. The cuckoo. The secret elite were influenced by the philosophy of the 19th century Oxford professor John Ruskin, whose concepts was built on his belief in the superiority and the th authority of the English ruling classes acting in the best interests of their inferiors. And they professed that what they intended was for the good of mankind, for civilization. A civilization they would control, approve, manage, and make profitable. For that, they were prepared to do what was necessary they would make war for civilizations, slaughter millions in the same, in the name of civilization, wrapped in the great banner of civilization. This became a secret society like no other before it. Not only did it have the backing of privilege and wealth, but it was also protected from criticism and hidden beneath a shroud of altruism. They would take over the world for its own good save the world from itself. The secret society specifically infiltrated the two great organs of imperial government, the foreign office and the colonial office, and established their control over senior civil servants who dominated these domains. In addition, 
They took control of the departments and committees that would enable their ambitions. The War Office, the Committee of Imperial Defense, and the highest echelons of the armed services. Party political allegiance was not a given prerequisite. Loyalty to the cause most certainly was. Their tentacles spread out to Russia and France, the Balkans and South Africa, and the targets were agents in the highest office of foreign governments who were brought and nurtured for future use. America offered a different challenge. Initially, the possibility of bringing the United States back into an expanded empire was discussed, but realistically, American economic growth and future potential soon rendered such an idea redundant. Instead, they expanded their power base to bring Anglophile Americans into the secret brotherhood, men who would go on to dominate the world through financial institutions and dependent governments. What more, they had the power to control history, to turn history from enlightenment to deception. The secret elite dictated the writing and teachings of history, from the ivory towers of academia down to the smallest of the schools. They carefully controlled the publication of official government papers, the selection of, do of documents for inclusion in the official version of history of the First World War, and refused to access and refused access to any evidence that might betray their covert existence. Incriminating documents were burned, removed from official records, shredded, falsified, or deliberately rewritten so that what remained for genuine researchers and historians was carefully selected material. Carol Quigley's histories have themselves been subject to suppression. Unknown persons removed tragedy and hope from the bookstore shelves in America, and it was withdrawn from sale without any, jurist without any justification soon after its release. The book's original plates were unaccountably destroyed by Quigley's publisher, the Macmillan, the Macmillan Company, who for the next six years lied, lied, lied to him and deliberately misled him into believing that it would be reprinted. Why? What pressures obliged a major publishing house to take such extreme action? Quigley claimed that powerful people had suppressed the book because it exposed matters that they did not want known. To this day, researchers are denied access to certain First World War documents because the secret elite had much to fear from the truth, as do those who have succeeded them. They ensure that we learn only those facts that support their version of history. It is worse than deception. They were determined to wipe out all traces that led back to them. They have taken every possible step to ensure that it would remain exceedingly difficult to unmask their crimes. We aim to do exactly that. Our analysis of the secret origins of the First World War uses Professor Quigley's academic research as one of the many foundational stones, but goes far deeper than his initial revelation. His, he stated that evidence about the cabal is not hard to find if you know where to look. We have done that, starting with the principal characters whom he identified, and the insider, Alfred Zimmern, confirmed that this book traces their actions, interlinked careers, rise to power and influence, and finally, explode, and finally exposes their complicity in ambushing the world into war. Quigley admitted that it was difficult to know who was active inside the group at any given time, and from our own research, we had added to his list those whose involvements and actions marked them out as linked members or associates. Secret societies work hard at maintaining their anonymity, but the evidence we have uncovered brings us to the considered conclusion that in an era that led into the First World War, the secret elite comprised a wider membership than Quigley originally identified. This book is not a fictional story conjured on a whim. 
Despite the desperate attempt to remove every trace of secret elite complicity, the detailed evidence was present. Chapter by chapter reveals a tragic tale of misinformation, deceit, secret double dealing, and lies that left the world devastated and bankrupt. This is comp conspiracy fact, not theory. A great many characters appear in the narrative of this history, and we have appended a list of key players for ready referral if required. The reader faces a tantistically a tantalizingly difficult challenge. These immensely rich and powerful men acted behind the scenes, shielded by the innermost core of the establishment, by controlled media, and by a carefully vetted history. The following chapters prove that the official version of history as taught for more than a century are fatally flawed, soaked in lies and half-truths. Those lies have penetrated so deeply into the psyche that the reader's first reaction might be to discount evidence because it is not what they learn in school or universities or challenges there or challenges. It is not what they learned in school or university or challenges their every assumption. The secret elite and their agents still seek to control our understanding of what really happened and why. We ask only that you accept this challenge and examine the evidence we lay before you. Let your open-mindedness be the judge.